Hello! The music is going on. The music is still going, but I am here. I am Felix Salmon of Axios. You are joining the Slate Money live show, which welcome one and all. I'm not entirely sure how many of you there are. I hope there are many of you. Um, welcome to everyone. I am Felix Salmon of Axios. I'm here with Emily Peck of HuffPost. Hello. I'm here with Anna Shemansky of Breaking Views. Hello. And we have a very, very special guest, Mr. Zach Carter, also of HuffPost. You can see him on Ooh. your screen. He has a prop behind him. Zach, what is the prop that you have behind you? It's, uh, it's a book. It's called The Price of Peace. Money, Democracy, and the Life of John Maynard Keynes. And you guys are not going to believe this, but I actually wrote that book. You wrote a book? Congratulations. The whole thing. Yeah. Is, is it your only book? Or have you, is, are you a serial book author? Uh, well, I, you know, I will at some point be a serial book author. But at, for now, it's my only book. Well, congratulations on writing A Life of John Maynard Keynes. We have referenced John Maynard Keynes many times on Slate Money, but I don't think we've ever really much talked about him on the show. So this is our opportunity. While everyone is pleased, jumping in, asking questions, let us know what you want us to talk about and we will talk about it. This is as close as Slate Money will ever get to a live call-in experience. So type your little questions into the, into the box and Britt will pass them on to us and we will ask them. But we are going to start by talking about Keynes, who, uh, help me out here, Zach, Englishman, a bit of a homosexual, basically reinvented the entire global economy. He, he's dead. So there's that too. Uh, you know, <laughs> uh, uh, I, think, I think Keynes, most people know him, at least I, I came into uh, contact with his ideas through an Econ 101 course, where I learned that he was the guy who said, you should spend money in a recession in order to sort of lift the economy up out of the doldrums. And it was okay for governments to run deficits uh, and, and uh, under those circumstances. And uh, it, it turns out that this is, this is like a very shallow, tiny piece of, of his, his life's work. He's this fascinating philosopher who was buddies with uh, everybody in the Bloomsbury set. So Virginia Woolf was one of his best friends his entire life. He's constantly hanging out with philosophers and debating the nature of truth and drinking champagne and having his hair cut and debating novels and poetry. And, and his economics is really an attempt to sort of express this sort of Bloomsbury credo to the world at large and make it something that's sort of a politically operable uh, public philosophy, not just something for people to do while they're getting their hair cut and drinking champagne, but something that's that's about or uh, th that's deeply ingrained with the way society is organized. Um, is, is it, are, we, are we off to a good start here? I can keep going. There's this is no, this is this is a, a, a great <laughs> start. So basically, when people say Keynesian, they generally just mean the economics. But what you're saying is that the economics is deeply sort of tied up with the whole world view. And so if I'm if, if something is Keynesian, it really does sort of mean this kind of left wing, but also liberal, like, but also like upper class kind of what noblesse oblige. Try and describe the Bloom Three group for us. It, it it doesn't fit any of our contemporary political categories in, in, in any like very clean way. We, we have uh, like the Keynesian economists today are people like Paul Krugman or, or uh, you know Stephanie Kelton, people who we associate with the political left or or liberalism or the Democratic Party. But Keynes himself is this kind of weird hybrid of all of these different currents that are happening in in what I would call like enlightenment liberalism more broadly. The, 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 the crises of the early 20th century are a huge problem for enlightenment liberalism because they're not supposed to be possible. People are supposed to be rational. They're supposed to be able to make good decisions. Democracies are supposed to avoid war. And yet we have World War I and the Great Depression. And, and these things are not, they're not supposed to happen. And Keynes is someone who really admires the sort of egalitarian ethos of somebody like Jean-Jacques Rousseau, 
but who also is very worried about social change and social upheaval the way that Edmund Burke is. And he's trying to find a way to synthesize all of these different philosophers into sort of a coherent um, sort of program for public action to to prevent you know radical change from becoming a problem. So it's it's very conservative in in a certain sense. But he's hanging out with all of these people who are you know basically they're they're middle class aesthetes. Um, but the British middle class at the beginning of the 20th century it's 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 not like the middle class today in in the United States. Like everybody in the United States today identifies as middle class. Like basically, unless you are getting getting hit by the Bush tax cuts, you are not considered you you are considered middle class in the United States. But in in Britain, I mean, it's it's it, it's sort of it means that you have time to engage in in the finer things to think about philosophy and write novels and you know you you maybe have a little bit of property so you don't have to you don't have to worry about getting evicted if you don't go to work on tuesday um that that's sort of the milieu he's working in so it's not it's not like he comes out of this sort of marxist revolutionary collectivist um kind of uh, kind of social scene he's he's hanging out with well-to-do people uh, and he ends up trying to he's trying to come up with a, a an economic philosophy that will allow that way of life to be preserved and i think when he's very young it, one of the problems with talking about keynesian economics is that keynesian economics changes over the course of his life you don't get to the general theory until 1937 but he's writing works of economic theory as early as 1912 and he keeps changing his ideas because his ideas keep not working uh, people people keep the, the social upheaval of the time just continues and and he he thinks okay well let's try something different let's try something different maybe this is not the way the world works and eventually you get to the general theory which is the sort of foundation i think of of modern economics as we understand it today but also a very selective foundation because different almost everybody that you know milton friedman is is the guy who's famous for saying we are all keynesians now we think that it's uh it, it's it's richard nixon richard nixon actually says i am now a keynesian in economics but milton friedman's the guy who says we're all keynesians now and he says this in a very sort of narrow sense that there are sort of a, a set of categories and ways of thinking about what the economy is that keynes really develops milton friedman very much not a keynesian um but what you actually do with those tools uh, is is something that has been, I think, hotly disputed ever since the 1930s. And Keynes himself, you know, by the 1940s, he has a, a fairly radical social vision that he wants to use these tools to implement. But you can use them for all sorts of purposes. Uh, you know, I think I think Donald Trump was a very Keynesian president in a certain respect. I mean, he ran up gigantic deficits and cut taxes and and didn't worry about about you know, spending a lot of money on the military, for instance. I think Keynes, in his social vision, would have found that offensive for, for a lot of different reasons. Um, but the sort of tools that he he developed as an economist, they're not necessarily progressive or conservative. They 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 don't fit any particular category. They're, they're sort of value neutral. What's interesting to me about Keynes is why he thought these tools were necessary to implement his, his broader progressive vision. Well, and I think that one of the most things, as you say, and as you say in the book, that is so interesting about Keynes is this evolution and are these contradictions? Because one of the things that Keynes does that is really interesting and I think really important is that he brings up the idea of uncertainty in economics. He challenges this idea that there are these underlying laws or formulas or kind of truths in economics mm -hmm. and, and says, no, actually, you know, you kind of need a human hand in there. The markets just don't always correct themselves. And then he titles his most famous work, General Theory. <laughs> you know, this is clearly, clearly a contradiction. And in the same way, that yeah. he, you know, he, he has this idea of evolution, but then to a certain extent, he dies. And then the people who take up his ideas seem to suggest that, well, no, actually, now we have found, you know, the, the ultimate truth, and it is Keynes. Yeah, I, I think your point there about you know, he called it the general theory. I mean, he was really trying to invoke Einstein with that. Like this, this, this is like the general theory of relativity. This is the general theory of economics. Here is a set of principles uh, about how the world works, and and yet the principles he comes up with are very amorphous, right? They're, they're not a lot of right angles. Well, well they would in, need to be right in order to be general. If you have to be able to generalize them across like any society at any time. It would have to be pretty amorphous. And 
I mean, frankly, they might be amorphous, but let's not hold him to an impossible standard. Everything in economics is pretty amorphous, like especially macroeconomics, which is his his field. I think criticizing a macroeconomist for the crime of being amorphous is like, well, it's macroeconomics. It's, it comes with the territory. Uh, you know, I think that's a wonderful point. Uh, but I think even even within the field, I think Keynes is is injecting amorphism <laughs> into, into the equation. I mean, <laughs> Keynes objects to the idea um, that that we can talk about rational decisions about about our livelihoods and about our finances. He says, look, we don't know what's coming down down the pike. We live in a, a condition of radical uncertainty. The, the basic problem for economic humanity, he would have said economic man, but we don't say those things anymore, um, is, is, is not trying to figure out how to, you know, rationally deal with scarce resources. It's, it's trying to figure out how to manage an uncertain future. And when you don't know what's coming, well, I should say, like, you know, this is this is an idea which exists right now. We have like Mervyn King, who used to be the governor of the Bank of England, has just come out with a book (laughs) called Radical Uncertainty, which is making exactly this point. It's not like Keynes is it's not like Keynes is uniquely. um, uh, Sort of what would you say, like at the epistemic fringes here, I think I think that one of the things that economists or like if you know if you get them in a sort of quiet moment when they're not bloviating on cnn they will tell you like there's no such thing as an economic forecast or you know an understanding of what's going to happen if we do this or if we do that that everything in economics is much fuzzier the 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 error bars are much bigger than anyone wants them to be, especially than the politicians want them to be, right? The politicians are the ones who are really to blame here for like requiring certainty from economists. I know, oh, I think that's the, right. The one and, thing and that, I, oh, oh, go ahead, Emily, sorry. Oh, to the point of um, the general theory being general and not having major rules for economics. The one thing that struck me in your book throughout was Keynes sort of putting ends first, putting cultural first, and putting kind of like the market last. And there is this sort of like, I think it's just sort of like a weird, arrogant, wrongheaded way of thinking of economics is like the market is this, right, is this like rational actor and there are rules you must follow. And like, like you were saying about scarcity, like you just have to manage scarcity. And Keynes kind of turns it all upside down. And he's like, the important thing is, you know, people <laughs> not going without, you know, having a, a, a sustainable society where, you know, people can thrive and, and be human. Like, that's the important thing. It's not about a certain amount of going on the gold standard or like these wacky rules that people think are are concrete and and unmoving and even as 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 everything has sort of advanced from back in those times it still feels like that's the push and pull in economics and in our politics you know with people we don't have enough money to help hungry people and say no 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 you help hungry people you figure out the money like money's not real let's let's be real about this like it seemed like Keynes understood what was real and what was made up. And he kind of knew money was kind of made up. He, he's, he's so so this like is cool. the question which yeah. I wanted to ask you, Zach, is, is actually directly about this, which is, um, you know, Keynes understands that what matters is the real economy. How, like people with jobs, people with, yes. pr- you know, companies that produce things. Um, and, and, you know, money is a unit of account, basically. And it's a useful thing which um, governments can print if they need to, and that can have certain consequences, which he felt. Now, square that, if you will, with Bretton Woods. Explain to me what happens in Bretton Woods, what Keynes's role is in, in Bretton Woods, and, and like what that meant for the entire international financial system for the you know subsequent, what, 40 years? It's, it's a huge... Years. Huge, huge question, uh, because what happens at Bretton Woods <laughs> is is basically a giant geopolitical uh, street fight, brutal one between um, John Maynard Keynes in the United States and Harry Dexter White, or John Maynard Keynes in, in the United Kingdom and Harry Dexter White in the United States. Um, 
who have different visions about what the sort of geopolitical hegemonic system is going to be at the end of, of World War II. And they don't fundamentally agree about the sort of underlying politics that are going to be guiding Bretton Woods. And uh, if you if you go through Keynes as early as 1930, he's starting to sketch these sort of ideas for, he can see that the gold standard doesn't work. And I think you know, when most of us talk about the gold standard today, we're talking about the convertibility of gold in a sort of domestic exchange kind of uh, kind of situation. Like, okay, if I've got a dollar, I can exchange it for a certain amount of gold. And that is important in, in you know, my ability to hold dollars or hold gold or, or other resources. But it, it was an entire system of international exchange. The, the whole point of the gold standard was that, you know, different currencies were sort of like different names for different amounts of gold. So you were able to, to conduct trade on this very predictable kind of, kind of basis. The problem with the gold standard, Keynes thought, was that when countries got into trouble, when their, when their deficits got out of whack, um, they were forced to their trade deficits, importantly, um, they were forced to deflate their currency values in order to um, make their their gold hoards sort of add up. And deflation resulted in a lot of suffering. It, it resulted in a lot of social pain. So high unemployment. And for Keynes, high unemployment, you know, that's bad. But what's really bad is the possibility that like the citizens are going to revolt and there's going to be no more haircuts with champagne. So he's really afraid of the sort of upper class system being overthrown, uh, you know, from from below by by this sort of, you know, angry proletariat kind of um, kind of situation. So he, he wants to create an international system where people don't get backed into this this kind of corner And his the, the, the program he comes up with for for Bretton Woods involves the deficit countries and the surplus countries sort of meeting in the middle. If you get backed into a corner because you have a big trade deficit, he's not going to make you responsible for fixing that problem by imposing pain on your citizens. You and the people, the country that has the surplus, they're going to have to come into balance together. Everybody's going to have to, to move their accounts together. So everything's not just all on, on the debtor, the, the country that's in the worst the worst position to deal with social revolt is is going to have you know some 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 level of leeway to work with this and also to prevent things from getting out of balance countries that build up surpluses steadily they have to turn them over they have to turn like they those surpluses can be seized by this sort of international super central bank like like this ultra international fed it's it's a really i think it's a really interesting vision and potentially something could be really useful at a new sort of Bretton Woods style conference. Um, but it just completely gets wrecked um, on on basically the American empire at Bretton Woods. It just, it, we don't even come close to having that um, that being implemented. And what we get at Bretton Woods instead is, is something sort of like a gold standard where the dollar is tied to gold, but there are these two very large bailout funds called the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, so that when countries get into deep imbalances, that there are funds available that can go to these countries to help them get out of, of this, this situation. And that system survives for like, by the time Bretton Woods is implemented, it, it, you know, it survives for like 10 years. I think it's nine years and a certain number of months that that actually survives. But those institutions, the World Bank and the IMF, still exist today, even though the Bretton Woods system itself is is totally gone. And it's in no way clear that the IMF or the World Bank really function as these um, institutions that help countries that, that genuinely help countries in need get out of these these sort of deflationary corners like Keynes was trying to trying to make it such that countries in troubles didn't have to resort to austerity. And I think for most of the history of the IMF, for instance, you know, I, I think it's pretty reasonable to say the IMF has has encouraged austerity rather than rather than prevented it. And to me, that this outcome, though, at Bretton Woods, just to a certain extent, speaks to a lot of the some of the biggest weaknesses in Keynes's theory, which is that, and maybe it's because of his background, he seemed to believe that you could have these kind of enlightened officials who would come to the right decisions. You could have so much planning in the economy. But what he's calling for was not what we think of as Keynes. 
Keynesianism, as you say in the book, it is a much more radical view. It is a, a really fairly centrally planned economy to a certain extent is what he's calling for. And what we see over and over again is that people are very flawed, leaders are very flawed. And his entire life, he saw that. His entire life was spent arguing with people who weren't doing what he wanted to do. And yet he designs a theory that only works if people are always doing the right thing. Yeah, I think I think there are two sort of really interesting, I don't know if paradox is the right word, but um, you know, Keynes, Keynes is just disappointed by the British government his entire life. He, a really foundational moment for him is at the Treaty of Versailles in 1919, where he says, you guys are being crazy. You're imposing completely unpayable reparations on, on Germany. And this is going to be economically disastrous, not just for Germany, but for the rest of Europe and, and the UK itself. And this, th th this is going to be, you know, totally awful. And, and his friends in Bloomsbury are like, yeah, see, we told you the government sucks. What are you doing? Why are you working for the government? And he's like, well, I need to figure out how to make the government work. The government, I swear to God, it's <laughs> we, we will find a way. But, but, <laughs> Good he, but he knows, like, you know, on one level, he knows just how terrible the British government is and how terrible the British empire is. But he also, you know, has this kind of idealized, like liberal imperialist vision of the British empire, where I think it's not too different from certain visions of American exceptionalism today, where, where the British empire is, is bringing the rest of the world into progress and prosperity and democracy and goodness and light. And, and he, he just can't really let go of that idea that, um, that, that the British government can be, um, this, this sort of useful guiding hand for, for progress. And, D despite his own, you know, very, very clear knowledge that, 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 that the government has failed him and the rest of the world very, you know, uh, catastrophically and, and, you know, unquestionably in his mind um, within his own lifetime. So he has this, this there's this strange duality where, where he has this deep faith in the ability of the technocrats who he um, despises um, to, to, to lift the world to a, to a higher place. But he also just believes in this kind of deep human rationality. And I, I think it's it's tempting to say that Keynes is, uh, you know, that he favors this sort of technocratic control of things. But when you talk about, when you, when you look into his his beliefs about how, how social change happens, where, you know, how ideas become popular, it's, it's rooted in a deep faith in the ordinary person to, rationally perceive the truth just as the truth and and that's a very democratic kind of um kind of vision and i i think there are elements to both of these things that are that are deeply naive but i also don't know how to extract them from any sort of um i don't know how you extract them from faith and democracy itself you know if if, if you really don't believe that that people can come to see the truth in in the face of good arguments um then, then how can you really believe in democracy as, as a, a form of social organization? So I have, have a question here from questions. Oh. Victor Whitehead. Yeah, um, we, have, <laughs> we have some listener questions, which we must get to. Let's talk a little bit about um, the legacy of, of Keynesianism. It, it fell out of favor for a while. So if you could explain a little bit like what that means for Keyn Keynesianism for, to fall out of favor, like what do you not do if you're not a Keynesian? Um, then it comes back with this thing called neo-Keynesianism. And maybe you can try and explain what the difference is between a Keynesian and a neo-Keynesian, or maybe it's just like another word for Keynesian. Um, and then as Victor asks, Victor Whitehead asks, um, what, comes next like if if you have we we had stephanie kelton on the show you mentioned her earlier modern monetary theory is that keynesian in its own way um and like and we have another question from sd denure basically saying uh what about austerity is that the opposite of keynesianism is that the thing that we give up if we give up keynesianism uh like try and try and like draw draw a little bit of like a little bit of a map here of what what would get included in Keynesianism and what and what would get included in like whatever the opposite is. I'll try to tell a historical story that incorporates the austerity in there. So in 
in the 1920s, when Keynes is really humming as a as a thinker, um, the sort of generally accepted view among British economists and and economists on on the European continent in, in the United States, economic the history of economic theory is like totally crazy and doesn't follow these these clear patterns. Um, but in the 1920s, there's this sort of idea that that markets are supposed to correct for disturbances, imperfections, distortions, and and included in those markets is is labor markets. So if you have a problem where suddenly, because of some unex, unforeseen you know shock to the system, people start becoming unemployed, what will happen is that prices will lower, the, the price of labor will decline to the point at which all of those people who are unemployed will be able to get jobs again. And the, and the system will, will correct for itself. So the, the logic of austerity in this, in this milieu is, is sort of let, you know, let, let markets correct um, so that the labor, labor market can recover. Now, that is independent of the sort of gold standard situation that's governing things. In the 1920s, governments can can actually run out of money because their money is tied to a certain amount of gold. And if if your gold is 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 moving to other countries through you know financial speculation or through a, a, a bad trade deficit, um, if you run out of money, you actually just can't pay people. If there's no gold, your 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 paper is not worth anything. So governments do have to in this in the situation find ways to make sure that they actually don't physically run out of money. Now, since the 1930s, depending on how you define the Bretton Woods sort of gold exchange standard, um, certainly since the 1970s, countries are not in, in a, governments are not in a situation where they're going to run out of money anymore. What you might have is a situation where governments spend so much money, they, they sort of spend new money into existence, and you have a, a, a problem of inflation where there, there are too many dollars chasing not enough, um, not enough economic activity. And that's, you know, that's bad for various reasons. People don't like inflation. They don't like to see their savings sort of evaporate through no fault of their own. But for Keynes, there isn't, there's not, there isn't one Keynesian theory over the course of his time as a thinker. We, we tend to focus on the general theory because it's this big breakthrough that says, yes, it's okay to do deficit spending. And that feels like a, an important sort of legitimizing event. But Keynes keeps doing economics and he gets increasingly radical as he gets older. So he, through Bretton Woods, after Bretton Woods, you know, he's, he's working on the beverage plan. Uh, he's, he's sort of the financial architect of nationalizing uh, British medicine, for instance. Um, he creates the modern, he's, he's really is, I think, the financial architect of the, the modern British welfare state. Uh, and that guy in the 1940s is not the same guy in 1919 who is criticizing the Treaty of Versailles. The, the economic ideas have changed, and his sort of vision of what the possibilities are for, for humanity have changed. And there aren't a whole lot of people who identify as Keynesians after World War II who really embrace that full sort of social welfare state, you know, sort of democratic socialism vision that Keynes has in 1944, 1945, 1946, right before he dies. What becomes popular in the late 1940s, early 1950s in the United States is a version of Keynesianism that says, look, the market works, people are rational. Um, this whole business about uncertainty, we're not going to worry about that. Um, what, what happens is that sometimes something sometimes things happen just shit happens the the economy gets thrown out of whack and you have got to the government's got to act to make sure that the, the economy gets back to this the state which is the normal state of affairs where markets work and things and things self-correct and so you spend money in a recession to sort of get the mechanism back to working again and by the 1960s People like John Kenneth Galbraith are starting to say, like, you know, these tools that we use to get the economy back to normal or back to full employment, they have distributional effects that are not neutral. It it does matter whether we cut taxes or spend more. It matters what we spend on when we spend things. And so he starts calling the type of Keynesianism that takes hold in the 1960s. He starts calling that, Galbraith does, 
reactionary Keynesianism. He says we're, we're cutting taxes for rich people in order and and exacerbating inequality in order to get the economy sort of back to back to level. And that's that that's basically sort of the I, I think that's kind of the neo Keynesian model that is um, at least philosophically um, dominant through the 1990s, even into the Obama administration. I mean, people may disagree about what the right policies are, but the, the basic view is that there's there's a market that's out there and there's a government that intervenes in that market. And the government is sort of unnatural. It's it's a distortion. And you have to use the government to get the market back to its its sort of normal state of of putting humanity on a glide path to prosperity. And you know, the people who are in that milieu who are uh, supporting these ideas are not necessarily conservatives. Like there are people like Joseph Stiglitz, who I think, I think um, espouses this, this kind of basic philosophical vision, um, you know, who's a very strong progressive guy, right? Like he does not want to cut taxes on, <laughs> on the rich and cut spending for, for the poor to, to make the economy uh, get, get back to normal. But he does kind of believe that the market is out there doing its own thing. And, and, and we, you know, the, the government has a role to correct for distortions, but not to sort of shape the whole thing. And I think where you, you get into sort of what, what was called post-Keynesian for a while. Uh, and and what, what that really means is just the Keynesians who kept working on Keynesian ideas after Keynes died at Cambridge. So this is people like Joan Robinson, like Michael Kalecki. It's, it's just the Cambridge University staff. Um, they they don't accept this basic distinction between the economy and the government and and they think they think that governments basically create markets they think that markets are are a product of different legal forms and i think that you know the closest thing to to sort of cambridge style economics in the united states today is the mmt crew in uh, in in which used to be at the university of missouri kansas city and now is spread out all over the place i i don't feel comfortable speaking on behalf of these guys, because they don't seem to have like a, they, they disagree with each other. So like, I don't know, <laughs> I don't know what MMT, what the pure spirit of MMT is, but I think people like um, Stephanie Kelton and Nathan Tankus, uh, you know, w when they are at least talking about how inflation works, how money works, to me that, that seems very broadly Keynesian in the sort of 1936 to 1944 Keynes um, understanding of things, which, which, you know, it feels very radical to people who are um, are from the, the other school because it, it basically says, you know, the government is the thing that does all of this. It's not just the government right. doesn't the, go the government, the government creates makes everything. money. Yeah. The government is responsible for markets and and it's all government. So the government can do whatever it wants. Um, mm -hmm. We should move on, though, because it's Christmas can we talk time. About Christmas? I, and we should talk about Christmas. Um, Emily, yeah. what is your Hi. what is your number one Christmas present? And let's not make it about like Keynesian stimulus from people buying Christmas presents. We want to we want to move away from Wait. that. Wait, what did you just ask me? What my number one Christmas present is? Christmas is that what you just asked is, me, Felix? Yeah, my number. One. I, that is my. That, well, that, my, that's what my, I just asked you. <laughs> the thing on my mind right now, as we are recording is the annihilation of the day known as Black Friday. I dislike Black Friday. I think it's the worst and it ruins a really good holiday for a lot of people. I come from a small town in Long Island where someone actually died in a Black Friday stampede at a Walmart a long time ago. So one of the good things about this pandemic, I mean, if you could call it a good thing, I don't know, <laughs> is that Black Friday shopping has been absolutely destroyed. Um, we just, Black Friday is the day after Thanksgiving, traditionally when there are a lot of what's called door buster sales, where um, big it's such a violent box metaphor, stores have big it? sales. Yes, Felix, it is. It's part of why I hate it. Yes. <laughs> this Friday, this Friday, there was a almost 40% drop in in-store sales at stores. And Black Friday been going out of fashion for a while, but the pandemic has accelerated this trend. And I was very 
I, I don't think I'm making a secret of angle here. I am really excited about this turn of events. So holiday shopping is on my mind. Um, and there are downsides to pandemics and holiday shopping that we could also talk about if you guys want to. Um, online shopping is obviously what everyone's doing right now. Um, that means all the cute little places that people buy holiday gifts that no one really needs but are fun to look at and give are in trouble, right? Like I don't commute right now through Grand Central, which means I don't get to look at all the little nifty little goo in the little Grand Central market anymore. And there's all these nifty little so shops pretty. all over the country that aren't getting that. Yeah. Um, so th that's what's on my mind about holiday, holiday shopping. I don't know what's on Anna's mind. Wow. Anna, what's on your mind? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, I wouldn't necessarily say that Black Friday has completely gone away. I would just say like the, the post Thanksgiving the like shopping frenzy has just kind of changed. It was already changing. And then this pandemic kind of made it change a bit more, which is that people started doing shopping a lot earlier. And if you kind of look at overall numbers and if you factor in both kind of online shopping, because unsurprisingly online shopping was, you know, far higher on Black Friday than online shopping had been in the past. And when, especially when you kind of look from that, you know, the, the Black Friday through Cyber Monday, the no total number of shoppers actually didn't decline that much compared to 2018, it did a bit to 2019, but 2019 was also a kind of bizarrely robust year. But I'm, I'm saying all this to say that like, I just, I think it's interesting that the, the way people are shopping is as we've seen in the pandemic and now as we're seeing it in the holiday is continuing to change. But like, I don't know, I I actually kind of have always liked the bizarre like Black Friday part of Thanksgiving, like that you could, you know, have your family kind of figure out like, okay, I'm going to stand in line and then the other two people are going to go and get the stuff. And then you have like a whole plan. Maybe I'm the only weird person who used to do that sometimes with family members, but like, I don't know, it, it was fun. And like, you know, now, now that's changing. Now we just sit and, and shop online, which I'm not going to lie. I actually like quite a bit, but. So, so my favorite, my favorite fact about Black Friday is that it was never the biggest shopping day of the year. The biggest shopping day of the year, is always the Saturday before Christmas Day. Um, always has been, always will be. And Black Friday was always much more of a media event than it was a retail event. Like retailers played the game because they got the media coverage and media after a very slow news day on Thanksgiving when nothing ever happens, loved the idea that they could go out and get lots of pictures of crowds of people standing outside stores who you know, on some level we're there just because that's where all the television cameras are. And if lots of television cameras are going to be outside the store, that must be newsworthy and important. So I'm going to go there and do some buy a flat screen TV or whatever. But like there, there is this weird sort of self-fulfilling prophecy to it. And yeah, I think I'm with Emily on this one. If it goes away, no one misses it, especially when we all just shop by randomly clicking stuff while we're scrolling through Instagram. Like you can do that any day of the week, <laughs> any day of the year. I mean, Cyber Monday is such an anachronism, right? Cyber Monday was this thing which existed <laughs> when the internet was something you went onto at work. Like you, you would have like a four day weekend at home where there was no such thing as an internet. And then you would commute back into your office on Monday and Monday was where you had the internet and then you would like do your cyber shopping on the cyber Monday on your cyber connected work computer. Like, obviously that's, that makes no sense anymore. So we are, I think, growing up a little bit, right? You know, we're, we're <laughs> buying things when it makes sense to buy them. When we come across them on the internet, we don't feel the need to fetishize like the day of the week or the month or the, holiday that we do the purchasing um or even for that matter the idea of um you know oh well saturday is my day off so that's the day i'm gonna go and do my shopping like everything has become especially nowadays in the pandemic you know i think the distinction between weekdays and weekends is is smaller than it has been in, in a long time and maybe that will persist even even into the future when there is no pandemic I think you guys are all right on this, even where you disagree. 
Uh, but doesn't this sort of sidestep the the broader question? I mean, like, what about the reason for the season, man? Like, you know, I've I've I myself have never been like a, a super devout like religious person, and the, the stuff about Christmas that has always gotten me animated, which I have always I've always loved Christmas since I was a kid, is all of this like kind of kitschy bullshit, right? Like, I love Rudolph the Red Nosed Reindeer and Frosty the Snowman and How the Grinch Stole Christmas, and like all that stuff at some point is ultimately about like buying shit. It's about buying shit and giving it to people and, and like you expressing and, your love for other people through consumerism and whether that happens. Except, on, like, can I just Friday say the after, best, go ahead. You, if you're going to bring up Rudolph the red nosed reindeer, I'm going to counter with my knockout punch, which is all I want for Christmas is you, which is anti-consumerism <laughs> and is a better song. <laughs> <laughs> there, there is this uh, there, the, the the Christmas love songs, right? Uh, but come on, man! I, I give you all I, all I want for Christmas is you. But like, pretty paper, pretty paper's a love song too. But it's about wrapping presents to your darling from you. That's because everybody likes presents. Because people <laughs> like getting right. things. <laughs> like, is, I don't want to be like, oh, consumers have been so bad. Oh, we just all want to spend time with our families. We want presents. People want presents. Oh, no. no yeah, yeah, People yeah. express affection for each other I'm by doing this. I'm buying things. presents. <laughs> yeah. No, buying presents so is really we, we good. Can, we and can it is all kind agree. of sad not to go out and go shopping and see all the decorations in the windows and stuff. Like, I like that. Um, yeah, we. I, I agree with all of you and the world that presents are good. Like Santa, are you listening? Please, I I like presents. So and the decorations, like man, I love the freaking lights. I love the yeah. reindeer. I love like when <laughs> when does green and red look good together? Only for one month, and it looks fucking great. They made these two horrible <laughs> colors look awesome for a whole month just because you like buying shit. That's great. <laughs> there's only there's only one thing I like about Saks Fifth Avenue, and that's this time of year when they put all the lights up and they and they make them dance to the Carol of the Bells opposite the Rockefeller Center Christmas tree. And you're like, wow! Like even Saks Fifth Avenue can become like a non-terrible place. No, for New York one City is year. mostly New York City is mostly an insufferable, unlivable hellhole. But New York City at Christmas, oh my god! <laughs> Oh wow! Best. Okay, now what we can. Now we have place. something to disagree about. Uh oh. <laughs> New York at Christmas. I mean, that is that is just it, it's 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 a fine thing. Are you going to debate Zach on New York City now, Felix? Is that what's happening? I, I, I mean, feel like I feel like. Are we going there? Zach's, Zach's shade on New York City. <laughs> I, I have like... been asked, by the way, in the <laughs> chat. I have a I have a question from from Victor saying. Hello from Montreal, wondering how Felix will throw shade on Canada this week. I don't need to throw shade on Canada this week because Zach is still going to throw shade on, on New York City. And that is even less, um, you know. Yeah. Have you ever been viable. to London? No one it's, it's just him. like it's New York, but better. Like, uh, give me a break. <laughs> no, that's wrong. Yeah. Zach, no, yeah, this is great. Stop. No, no, London, God. <laughs> London's great too, like you, you walk around actually... there and people, people think you're going to be British and then you talk and you sound American and they get surprised and it's fun. That's just so you, like you are actually. I don't think I know, English. it's just me. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Felix. You are an expert on Christmas songs. Am I, am I wrong about this? You, you can tell us, um, let's wrap this up with a little Tell us about Rudolph. Number. We don't have a numbers round. But you can give us a number of just how much money was made by Rudolph the Red Nosed Reindeer. I mean, how, how much is too much, man? A lot. I mean, they over over eighty million records sold. I think by the nineteen eighties. It's it's been a while since I looked at the. It's been a whole year, in fact, since I looked at the exact figures. But Rudolph the Red Nosed Reindeer was for a long time the best selling song ever, like of all songs that had ever been written by anyone it just to, to to use numbers to talk about its success is sort of to to miss there's sort of like american music down here 
and then there's Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer up here. Like that, that, it's a different thing. It's like not really even music anymore. It's just this, it's just like culture. <laughs> I was, so, everyone this, should go this, read yeah. Zach's Haynes piece. Haynes would have really approved. Everyone, everyone should read Zach's piece on the origins of Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. Cause I had been hearing from my mother-in-law for years. She would say when I was growing up, there was no Rudolph. And then Rudolph just appeared and like, he's like late breaking, not like true Christmas character. And then I didn't understand any of that. Then I read Zach's piece. And now I understand the capitalist origins of Rudolph and just the subversive nature of Rudolph. It's truly fantastic. And we have to put a link somewhere. Someone will put a link somewhere so you can read this story. He's, he's like, or just he's Google it. Google yeah. Zach Carter, oh, yeah. Rudolph the Reindeer. Like, oh, it'll right, come you can do that, right? It's the magic of the internet. It'll make it happen. Mm -hmm. I've heard about that. No, he's like Rudolph, though. He, he's, he's like Keynes. He's slippery. He changes. You know, he, he's this product of a Montgomery Ward promotion in, like, 1939. But the reason we all really remember Rudolph is because there's a TV special in the 1960s where Rudolph kind of gets, like, a little bit woke and maybe a little bit gay. <laughs> like it, he becomes like a very like inclusive figure uh and uh you know uh i god i i love that myth it's just it's beautiful it has absolutely nothing to do with christianity like zero right it's just it's well, not like christmas, weird right <laughs> i mean santa's I mean, there christmas is, is, I it, is this weird like <laughs> like inch thin veneer like 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 paper onion skin thin veneer over the standard like pagan midwinter festival that we don't believe in paganism anymore. So we need to pretend that it's Christian. So we'll, we'll, we'll talk about three wives, men and a star and frankincense and stuff, <laughs> which makes for um, a great story as well. Um, Anna, do you know what frankincense is? I imagine it's some type of like scent. Is it a perfume or something? I, I mean, it's okay. incense. That's cool. <laughs> but yeah, it, there's also it's, myrrh. It's, What's it's, myrrh? Myrrh, awesome. exactly. <laughs> love, they love blood. Oh yeah, there's 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 tales we tell each other at Christmas, and they might involve reindeers, and they might involve myrrh. myrrh. Um, but it's about storytelling, and storytelling is timeless, and storytelling will always be with us. And it's a, and it's the shortest day, the longest night, so we have lots of time to gather around the fire and tell stories or in the case of the america of the 1960s gather around the television showing the rudolph the reindeer right, rudolph Fritt television special isn't it weird though that like it, it used to be sort of a a like halloweenish like ghost story holiday like like uh -huh. the brits like you know the, these great great horror stories like the turn of the screw and stuff are all like people camped out on cold winter nights around Christmas telling ghost stories to each other. And now we, we only tell happy stories that are about like reindeers who turn out to be great anyway. Like, how did that change? <laughs> oh, there's Die Hard. Don't forget Die Hard, the great Christmas movie. <laughs> but die, even Die Hard is like, you know what? That's deep. Fascism is true, but we all made it. <laughs> you know, like it's it's it's, it's not like oh my god, the children are dead. Population. Oh, like, well, that's why, <laughs> because of the, the joys of capitalism, we became a more prosperous population and no longer sat around and told ghost stories. We watched Die Hard. We watched Die Hard instead. On which I note, I think. Profound uh, observation. <laughs> yeah, Wait, I think, ask I think Anna, Anna about her tree. Victor wants to know. Oh yes, final question from Victor. Anna, when are you going to decorate your tree? Is it going to stay denuded? Oh, no. Oh, no. I'm from the Midwest. We do not do denuded trees. Um, yes, it was going, it would have had lights on it as of yesterday, but I bought the wrong lights. So Amazon tells me my lights will come on Friday. Thus, that is when my tree will be decorated. Are, are the lights, these um, billionaires, do, they, man. do they come with their own IP address? Can you control them from your phone? <laughs> Sadly, no. I feel like everything needs to be connected to the internet these days, even I your need, Christmas. I need tree. smart Christmas lights, yeah. So I can uh, control them so across if you have, So that's gonna be that's gonna be my Christmas gift to Anna this year. I'm gonna get her some smart Christmas lights, which I can then hack into and control her house. Um, many thanks to everyone for um, listening to this 
curiously structured conversation. It worked out in the end, thanks to Zach Carter. Thank you for turning up. You know, we don't just throw this thing together, you know. It it was all planned, with, with very, very, very planned out. Um, Emily, thank you so much for surviving whatever time lag issues you had and coming through strong. I I appreciate time your, traveling um, here. I appreciated your disquisition on Black Friday, and I think we're going to record it and play it on an annual basis every Christmas. Uh, on which Great. note, um, thank you. And thank you for tuning in to Sleep Money Live.